<laughs> Simon Rule, good morning, Mr. Young. It is. I am. I tell you what, there isn't a Sunday morning for quite some time that I haven't felt this knackered. Um, and I'll, I'll show you why, because the uh, I think I left you last Sunday with the um, the fabrication of that. Uh, the, um... ooh, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. There we go, that's better. Um, with the fabrication of that bracket for the RRVs. I say that bracket, there was 14 of them, uh, a total of 130 separate components to make, and um, there's been some long nights, including last night, to be honest. So, yeah, a bit of a pain. Right, it's done now. Well, it's almost done. It's, not, it's actually not done at all. I've still got to clean them up. I've still got to notch the main bracket. I'm, I'm, uh, in fact, you can give me your opinions, because I've been holding that off um, for uh, a sort of the last job before cleanup and paint. Um, let me find the prototype. Hang on. Okay, you might remember this from last Sunday. Not sure if you do or not, but I have. This is only one half of it. It's this one is a 12 mil plate on the new on the Mark III, which I've just done now. There's a 10 mil plate to notch and a 12 mil plate to notch, and there's two notches in each. And that's the notch uh, on the hang on it and the front on the front plate. It's a deeper notch, but it's only a 10 mil. I think from memory, this is 13 millimeters down, so it's quite a chunk of material to remove. Now, obviously, you know, when I first did the prototype, I just got the grinder and ground it all out and then used a, well, manually filed it to, uh, to get the, the finished shape. But I've got a lot to do. So, um, well, there's actually, there's 14. So there's 20. There's almost 60 notches to do out of some pretty thick plates. So my plan, and another reason why I've been waiting, is... Um, Yes, I know a milling machine would be fantastic, but I can't afford one at the moment. It's just not going to happen. Uh, is to get, uh, or to use, should I say, a cut-off, um, a steel cut-off tool, you know. A bit like a grinder, but bigger. Uh, or a, I suppose you'd call it a, a mitre saw if you're using a, a woodwork. Uh, so a cut-off saw with uh, the widest disc I can get, which is a four millimeter, so almost a grinding disc, really. Uh, and then just make up a depth stop, which obviously will need to be continuously adjusted because the disc will wear down. And then I can just move the workpiece across in the vise and just take a little chomp out and move it across and take another chomp out and then finish it off with the little finger file that I got. That's the plan. If you've got any better ideas or different ideas of how I can create that notch uh, with ease, then let me know. Anyway, let's see who we've got. Andy babbles on as always. So we've got Roger Heaps. Good morning, Andy. Good morning, Roger. You're the first one in the room before me by the looks of it. Simon, good morning, Mr. Young. Good morning, Simon. Good to have you on board. And Killswitch BB. Hey, buddy. Good morning, Killswitch. Jim K. Good morning, Jim. And Jim. I knew Jim was going to turn up today. He always turns up to my live streams. Uh, Jim, I don't know if you're aware or not. But another donation popped up through PayPal the other day. Um, I was just hoping that you hadn't set up like an auto payment thing, uh, and it, it, you know by accident, and it had gone through without you realising. So please flip me an email and let me know um, if I need to bounce it back. Of course I will do. Um, if it was intended, then Jim, seriously, thank you very much. And um, the first the first uh, payment or donation that you made. Um, about a month ago, I think it was, uh, went towards a new grinder that I got. Uh, and there's going to be more about that on this video because, well, they sent me the wrong one. We need to talk about that. Uh, Jim Haynes, back home this week in Virginia after a Nebraska trip. Well, welcome back, Jim Haynes. Uh, I'm pleased you had a safe trip and, um, well, you can tell me more about your adventures. Interesting. Simon Watling. Good morning, Andy. Good morning, Simon. Simon Roll. Uh, can you mill on the lathe, but will be hard with that plate? N no, it's just not something that's going to work in the lathe, unfortunately. I don't get it. it well, it just, it just isn't. Sorry, Simon. Um, I've been racking my brains to different ideas. Uh, it needs to be square cut as well, which is important. 
Uh, it rests against it, or it actually locks in snugly. It's quite an accurate cut to uh, some chassis rails, or basically box section. Uh, and that's what transfers the force. So it's got to it's got to be bang on the way it's cut. Uh, Graham McLucky, good morning, Andy. Good morning, Graham. Connor K. Hey, Connor's got off his ship. Here we go. Hey, Andy, I just came on. The like has been clicked. What a bloke. He's straight up there. So if you're not click the like, well, it's a bit early to click the like button. I'll, I like to watch a bit of the video first and find out if the presenter's actually putting an effort in. Um, you know, because there's some terrible videos on YouTube. It really is. And, and I'm, I'm not saying all mine are great because they're not. There's, there's a few of mine that I probably should really consider redoing at some point. Um, Mike Bus, uh, Busansky. Howdy from Virginia. Well, howdy, Mike. I'll give you a coffee cheers. There you go. So let's get, oh, what does um, Simon say on mega projects? Let's get into it. I do like mega projects. Very interesting. Lots of facts in there. Um, he's not a sponsor of the channel and I don't sponsor his. Uh, although I do think I'm going to buy a t-shirt. I do like the old blueprint t-shirts that he's come up with. So who knows? If you've not seen mega projects and he has a few other channels, check them out because they're actually quite interesting. So where is it? Hang on a second. Hang on. Jeez, I really, really need a bigger bench for this kind of stuff. But anyway, such is life. Okay. Um, now, let's talk grinders. So, you might have seen a post that I did on, on Instagram, I think it was, Instagram or Facebook, of, uh, yeah, the armature fell out the other day. I was showing Craig. Um, now, this is a, I call it a metaboo, but I think people call it a metabu. I think it is. The correct pronunciation. Uh, this is a grinder that I bought many, many years ago. It's performed phenomenally well. It's probably 20, 25 years old. Um, I do remember the first few years we had it, it only had light duty because we had it down in, in the cabin down at the car park for the off-road center. And it was there for sort of emergency use. So it didn't really get a lot of work. And then it ended up in the workshop and it got basically beaten up. Uh, worked it every, well, very, very hard. Any fabrication job, this was involved. Um, then it came to New Zealand and it's done a hell of a lot of work here. It's basically cut all the steel work that you can see in the workshop, plus m probably hundreds of other jobs that have come in and gone out. And obviously the job that I'm doing now involved a lot of grinding, a lot of cutting actually, a hell of a lot of cutting. Um, I probably got through, well, Jared gave me 10 cutting discs I probably had a few in stock so let's say 15 uh, and then I bought another 25 so that's 40 and I probably used another 10 so about maybe 50 cutting discs to get done what I needed to do because 12 mil plates it's pretty thick stuff to cut through isn't it and I don't have a plasma cutter not yet now this grinder started to make a bit of a noise when I was using it and it, I thought oh hang on that's a bit weird it doesn't normally make that kind of noise so I stopped and I checked the backlash on the pinion drive and well, it sort of turned about, about 180 degrees before it latched onto a tooth. So it was pretty clear what the problem was. And uh, well, I, I thought, well, let's keep going. Demise of another tool. And it lasted about another 20 seconds, believe it or not. Uh, and that's the pinion. And you can see, hang on, yeah, a bit more in focus. You can see the teeth have massively worn down and of course, you've got the, the crown wheel, I suppose you'd call that as well. Look, completely screwed. Still a few teeth on it. Well, the teeth are still there. Some are more damaged than others, obviously. There you go. Look, there's a few down here that are a bit chomped. But um, good old tool. Did incredibly well. Put up with a lot of grief. Very sad day. Um, I thought, holy crap, I'm going to have to use my rechargeable. And, and it's too big a job for that. It would have killed it. And I'd have, I'd have spent my life charging up batteries. Uh, and it would have probably, you know, reduced the life of the battery packs because it's quite a fast discharge on those. So I rummaged around in the bottom um, drawer and I found a mains powered Makita grinder that I bought for Ben a few years ago, which I'd fixed. And it, I thought, I couldn't remember whether I'd fixed it or not. And I was thinking, shut up, it works. And it's been brilliant. It's been really, really good. It's probably cut two thirds of this steel work. 
and it's only about an 800 watt grinder. It's a really light duty little grinder. I think this one, and this has always been up to the job, it's a bit hard to tell because the, um, because the little sticker on the side has completely gone now, look. It's, it, there's gibberish basically on there. I think this is about a thousand watt, but it says here on air, W, it looks like W10 space 125 quick. Now that's the, the coding that Metabu, uh, Metabu use for their grinders. And a W10 would indicate a thousand watts. So I think it is a thousand watts. But anyway, we're gonna order some parts and I'm gonna fix it because I, I don't want it to die. The old armature looks pretty good. It fell out the other day, so I'll have to fit some new brushes anyway, but the old armature looks absolutely mint. Grinders never caused a problem, never let any smoke out, never smelt burnt. It's just awesome. So it's definitely worth fixing. Anyway, let me get rid of this. And I ordered a new one. So I'm gonna come back to the comments in a minute. Let me, let me get my little spiel out of the way, otherwise I'll, I'll forget stuff. Um, so, I ordered a new grinder. Uh, I ordered it from, and I'm not naming and shaming, these guys have been absolutely fantastic. This is the company I use. They're in Rotorua, believe it or not, and they're also a Teng Tools supplier, and they do Makita tools as well. They're a Makita, what do they call it? A Makita Central Store. So obviously they've got lots of stuff there, so I'll have to call in next time I'm in, I'm in Rotorua. And that's their contact details if you're in New Zealand. Um, now, you know, any any Metabu outlet can sell you a Metabu tool. And I did actually ring two or three up to get prices. But it wasn't, although they did me a fantastic deal, and that's why I initially went with them, their service was absolutely brilliant. Um, part of my job with my employer, looking at the, the motorcycle dealerships workshops, is what service they provide their customers. And I must admit, surplus tools and machinery, as they're called in Rotorua, uh, and they're not a sponsor, and they didn't they didn't know I had a YouTube channel when I ordered the grinder. Um, 11 out of 10. Fantastic service. Um, I paid for next day delivery. It didn't turn up next day. That wasn't their fault. That was the courier firm. And it is a rural delivery, so, you know, not the end of the world. And I had another grinder, so I kept going. It wasn't a problem. And the grinder that I ordered is this one here. And this is where it starts to get interesting. This is the same, the version, it's a, uh, hang on, what is it? It's a, oh, hang on, it might be on the invoice, bear with me. It's a W17, it is, it's a W17, so it's a 1700 watts, it's a massive improvement, a bit heavier, obviously, uh, so it's a, a W17-125Q, uh, which is Q is for quick release, and I'll show you the quick release in a minute, because that's brilliant. Um, anyway, they all, it turned up, and I opened the box, and I went, oh, fantastic. This is exactly what I wanted, and it's got the on and off switch on the side. Now, that means that you can turn it on, move your hands around on the tool, whatever position you're in, and the grinder will keep running. When I opened the box, lo and behold, it wasn't the same grinder in the box as on the outside of the box. They'd sent me, inadvertently, the paddle switch version, which you've got to push forwards and then it'll, you know, you've got to go like in a forward motion towards the, the cutting disc or whatever you're using, uh, and then it'll click down. And you've got to keep, you've got to maintain pressure on that. And as soon as you let go, it pops up and the grinder turns off. And um, I've always, you know, I, I only came aware of this paddle switch thing when, um, when I bought my Makita, my replacement Makita 18 volt rechargeable grinder which is down in the drawer what can get it you've seen it on videos um and the guy said oh you need to have one you, know, you should really be using one of these paddle switch ones now rather than the old school switch because that's the law in new zealand and i'm like what the hell and this is yeah if it's a commercial environment that's what they have to use now they have to have the paddle switches it's a health and safety thing i said oh well, um this is just a domestic purchase i'll just i'll go for the old switch you know so i, I found managed to find one with the old switch which i'm very pleased that i did um, so I wasn't too sure how I would get on with a paddle switch and I do a lot more cutting than I do uh, grinding or I suppose cleaning up but the bottom line is whatever you're doing with it you know or the work that I do I'm moving the tool around in my hands to different positions to, to get you know when I'm cleaning up or whatever and, and when you're cutting see when you, sorry when you're grinding your tools sort of 
you know, in that orientation. And this is down and your hand can easily keep the trigger on. But when you're cutting, the tool's 90 degrees different like this. And now the switch is on the side, but my hand doesn't want to be there. I don't want my hand there. I want my hand, usually when I hold these tools and I'm cutting, I, I, I essentially I hold it like that. And then I use my second hand over the guard to stop any sparks. Because I, I've started just to wear glasses when I'm cutting steel, but I use my hand to sort of shield the sparks hitting my face. Um, and I find I can see a lot better because my, my face mask at the moment is a bit crap. So I did try it. With, I, I put a disc in, but I, I fired it up. I didn't cut anything, but I sort of pretended to cut something. And I found that the paddle switch was really inconvenient. And given the fact that I'll stand there for two or three hours cutting steel, um, I was not going to get on with it. So anyway, I rang them up. I said, look, this was, this was yesterday morning. I rang them up and said, hey, there's been a problem, been a mistake. Uh, it looks like an old box it came in. I think somebody's pulled the grinder off a display rack, found a box, popped it in um, previously, and then somebody's gone to go and pull it from stock. And of course, it's in the wrong box and you've sent it out. And you haven't opened the box to check, but that's incidental, I suppose. Um, when can you get me the right grinder? And the lady said, oh, 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 uh, there's not a lot I can do today because it's Saturday and we shut in a few hours. Um, but we'll order you one because we don't have the right one here. And, um, well, she lives only a few kilometers away, she said, because uh, obviously she knew my address uh, from the delivery. And, um, well, they're going to organize one and I'm going to meet up one evening and do a swap. Dead easy. But the reason for this conversation really is the paddle switch. Have you got a paddle switch grinder? And if so, do you like it? Do you find it as easy to use as the normal switch? Or do you wish you'd bought the normal switch grinder? Because chances are those normal type switch on off grinders won't be available for much longer. So stock up. Now, there you go. <laughs> Andy's little rant, sorry, we need to go back, hang on. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Uh, oh, I haven't done too badly. Oh, hey, we're okay, you guys have all stopped doing your comments while I've been giving my little spiel. Um, uh, 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 Mike Bosansky, howdy from Virginia. Uh, Graham McLucky, get a vertical slide from Machinery House and put a milling cutter in the lathe chuck. Ooh. Ooh. All right, Graham. Um, great idea for next time. And I'm sure I'll be making some more. Honestly, I'm, I'm not looking forward to it. It's been a, there's been a lot of hours gone into these. Um, that's a good idea. We could try that, couldn't we? Right. Well, what I need to do is take a, because these comments disappear. This, it really annoys me. I don't know how to keep them on the, on the video. Once the video goes to a normal video on the channel, all the original comments just disappear, and I don't know what the hell's going on. There we go. Look, right, Graham, I've got that. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Jim K, if I was going to make those brackets lovely, I would have I would have one of our local shops burn them out with a laser. I did the first time, Jim. I did. I had to make six of them, and it was a company called Precision Laser Cutting in Auckland. Now, the name Precision tends to instill accuracy you know when you're talking about the company and and you know late you'd expect a laser cutting company to be pretty accurate in what they cut out and i gave them the prototype it wasn't like i gave them a drawing i just said right i need what was it six of each of these and there were two there was the the, the forward bracket and the rear bracket they made them and they were very happy and i was very happy two problems they'd cut them from flat plates which i suppose is what you do when you do laser cutting and the heat, because they're quite slim and quite long, 570 mil from memory, um, they'd distorted, they'd burred. Not good. I needed them to be dead flat. Problem one, maybe my oversight, not theirs. But they could maybe have said, hey, because of the shape of it, if we laser cut that, it, it was not going to be flat. Okay, can't do that. Wouldn't have gone down that route. Worst thing was getting my prototype back. And, and I didn't realize until I got home, this is how, I mean, we're all pretty dumb, to be honest. Um, they'd made them 40 millimeters longer. And the, unfortunately, the 40 millimeters additional length was between the two notches. So I had to cut every one in half 
grind gussets, cut out the 40 mil, grind, you know, grind a, a groove on both, weld them up, and then flat them back off. It took me a whole day to do 12. It was just a absolute ball ache. It was a sham. I, I mean, I, I, I think I waited till lunchtime before I'm, I, I pulled a pin and got on with it because I was fuming. I was not happy at all. And um, yeah. I fixed it, but man, a whole extra day's labor. They did compensate me for it. It's not a problem. Nice chaps, and it was just an error in the drawing, but they should have checked the finished product against the prototype, the sample that I gave them, just to you know, physically just double check that everything looks about right. And all, clearly they didn't do that. Anyway. So Jim, that's why I did everything myself this time. They had to be flat. Couldn't use laser cutting. Couldn't use laser cutting because there was no guarantee they were going to be exactly as I needed them to be. And these have to be absolutely bang on. There's no room for any movement, unfortunately, because they're a bracket that bolts to an existing frame that's already made. Um, and, well, that's it, basically. It is. Um, now, Simon, just been getting some uh, Metabu stuff. Uh, a few weeks back, I'm very impressed with the quality. I, I am too, Simon. I mean, I, I, I have a, um, where is it? I have a Metabu, oh, pardon me. I have a Metabu uh, jigsaw, which I've had for years. Really good, very good throttle control. Um, you know, you can go very, very slow with it, slowly with it for very accurate cuts. I do like it. Um, and of course, with the grinder, the, the grinder's proved itself. I mean, it's lasted so many years, and it's had a lot of abuse. I could not go and buy a different brand grinder. I had to go and buy the same brand because it proved itself to me. So, yeah, I'm very impressed. I think I have bought a new power drill eventually, uh, one for doing masonry and stuff. That is a Makita. If it hadn't have been a Makita, it would definitely have been a Metabu or Metabu, call it what you like. Um, yeah, I, I am Sam. I mean, I'm not going to pull this one apart because it's got a warranty that this has been the new one, but I'll be interested to see the difference in build quality between this new one and the one that's about 20, 25 years old to see if they've maybe dumbed things down and gone a bit cheaper on the bearings and, and stuff. A bit like um, AVE does, I suppose, with his, his tools. It's a very informative channel. Again, if you've not seen his channel, and here's me pushing viewers across the different channels but i find his videos really good some of them are really good not all of them some are really good um same for all of us uh now then simon watling never had any problems with makita stuff well no me neither to be honest i mean the, the only fact the fact is um i had a rechargeable grinder for makita that i'd had again for many many years in the uk brought it out here done lots of work with it clearly asked too much of it and eventually it failed. And that was really user error as opposed to the grinder itself. I just pushed it too hard. I think it had a flap disc in at the time, which is a hell of a load on the grinder. Um, you know, especially when you're trying to clear off some material that maybe you should be using a grinding disc for, but you can't bother to switch the disc across. And one day it just gave up. Uh, I did fix it, put a new armature in it, new brushes, and it's died again. I think it's just brushes this time. I don't know. I don't know. I haven't. Well, have I pulled it apart? Yes, I have pulled it apart. It's in a drawer somewhere. Um, so I need to fix it. I'm not going to let it die. I will fix it again. But I did go out and buy a new one because I needed to get going again. Um, Jim Haynes, have you ever seen any uh, UK made electric tools like a drill, etc.? If so, when when did they go away? Um, I used. <laughs> I think, wasn't Black & Decker originally UK, uh, British made? I don't know. Uh, I know it's not anymore. Um, I think I think possibly the old, the old, old Black & Decker stuff was British made. Simon Roll will definitely know this. Um, I also had, and again, I don't know the origin, I, I bought a wolf drill. It was red. It was a hand drill, a pistol drill. And I had that for years. It, no, I mean, I bought that when I was a kid. I was probably about... 13 or 14 i bought it probably in fact i think my grandfather got me it from work because he was um he was a sales rep uh a tools sales rep for a company called acs uh commercial i think it was called 
they were in um, in York, and he was a rep, and he would go around all the different dealerships or all the different garages and supply them tools. He was a they were a brittle agent, um, Wolf again. They were an agent for them. They were agent for all sorts of stuff. And uh, if he got stuff back under warranty that was still good, like a spanner that had been supplied with a, with a mark on it, he used to give me it. And it'd go in the toolbox. You, I mean, it was great. I had, a, I had a real mixture of tools. And I have a lot more tools than what's in this workshop. In the, in the other shed that's in the garden, which is full of crap, uh, there's some of my original ammo boxes that I got in the UK. When I left the UK, I filled them up with my old tools. And there's ammo boxes full of spanners. And eventually... I mean, we're not far off now. Eventually, when I get back in that shed and clear it out, they'll all end up in here in the in the roll cabs and stuff because oh, it's sacrilege leaving them out there because they're going to go rusty and stuff. And I, I want to get them back here and give them a clean up and give them some love and hopefully start using them again. Uh, Jim K, I won't own a paddle switch grinder. I'm the same, Jim. Absolutely. I, 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 within seconds of using it, I knew it wasn't going to work for me. Um, I mean, sure, you could put it. You could, jeez, you could put a zip tie on it, but the whole reason why they've gone for paddle shift grinders is for safety, so that when you put the grinder down, it has to turn off because that's the nature of the switch. But, to, but the only way I can see to bypass that without pulling the whole thing apart and fitting your own switch or whatever um, would be to uh, chuck a zip tie on there. Turn it on, zip tie it up, and off you go. Um, but then you're going to be more inclined to leave it on all the time, which is even more dangerous than the original on-off switch. So it, it just doesn't work for me. So it, it's going to get swapped. I need the on-off switch type grinder. I didn't realize how important it was. It is really important. Jim Haynes, Black & Decker was always an American company. Ah, from Baltimore, Maryland. But I guess they had a UK factory too. I think they did. I know when you sent them back for warranty. I remember, this is going back a long, long time now. I remember um, if you were to send it back on the warranty card, it was an English address. So they must have had somebody in the UK doing the repairs at least. Simon, Black & Decker factory used to be in, here we go, look. Spennymoor, County Durham. Unsure if it was a British brand, though. There we are. So we've got a few pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, and we've worked it out. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, now, talking about grinding stuff, I was speaking to Jared huh, from Forge. Don't smoke, kids. Honestly, don't do it. Get smoke in your eyes. Um, and he was—he gave me some some cutting discs. I, I'd run out of cutting discs, and he said, "Oh, we've got some here. You can have some." Uh, these aren't the ones that Jared gave me, but he did tell me, and I was totally unaware. I've used grinding discs and cutting discs all pretty much all my life. He said, "Oh, did you know that they're um, they expire?" And I'm like, "We on about they expire?" He says, "Yeah, yeah, they can expire." And he said, "Look, if you look in the center, this is a, a flexivit. This this is my preferred choice. They're good ones. If you look in the center here, let me read that or not. It's got a date stamp." Now, Jared said, you've got to tell your viewers this. Uh, imagine on this, it does vary a little bit the way that they do it between brands. Um, there's a, another code just there, look, which is, golly, what is it? It's a, it's, it's upside down, Andy. God. V, oh, there we are, look. V07. There, look. Now, the other one is 2023. Just a year. So I imagine that this disc expires at the end of 2023. And now you say, well, how, how can a cutting disc expire? Well, the reason why they expire is to do with the bonding agent used for the material. And over time, it breaks down. And I don't know if you've ever had a cutting disc explode on you. I've had a few. And it's at that point you really wish you were wearing a full face mask and not just a pair of goggles, believe me. Um, these things go off like a little bomb. They, they fire shards all over the place. And, and some of the shards can be pretty big. Um, so there you go, date stamp, and the same thing, I was looking at the Flexovit flap discs that I got as well, and I, I always use these. Um, uh, again, we've got, now this is quite worrying, and I might ring Jared up, actually, if he's going to answer his phone. This has got a code there, look, which ends 2018! 2018! It's 2020! This disc might explode. I don't know. Should we ring Jared? Jared, if you're watching this, I'm going to ring you up. 
and you need to answer your phone. I need to know something. Contacts. Where is he? Oh no, let's just go from texts, messages. Jared, porch guy, call. Speaker. He's gonna love this. He's gonna love this. He, he, there's all sorts going. Can you hear that okay? Tell me if you can hear me okay. I think you should be able to do. Hello, sir. Jared, are you watching the live stream? I am. Well, I'm not now because I have to watch it on my phone. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry for calling you on a Sunday morning, sir. Yeah. Um, you told me I had to tell people about the date stamp on the cutting discs and grinding discs and stuff. Yes. So we're doing very, that. very uh, safety conscious thing to know. It is. It really is, and I, I was totally unaware. And I, I've nobody's ever mentioned it to me to me before. Not even anybody that sells me them. So um, yeah. very interesting. Now I've got a Flexovit um, flap disc here. It's an eighty grit, and it's got a yes. it's got a, a marking in the centre on the boss, uh, which says GB zero two zero one eight. Now I only purchased these a couple of weeks ago from BOC in Auckland. And from the information that you've given me, which I, I don't doubt in any way whatsoever, it indicates that that disc expired two years ago. It does indicate that from everything I've ever been told and taught. Um, the stamp, the date stamped in there, it does vary. Sometimes it can be the month of the year, and other times it's the quarter. So oh, that was it, yes. Uh, yeah, so... That's the only variation in cutting and grinding discs that I've ever known. Mm. Now, BOC are a good company. And they are. They've got great quality control. Yeah. Um, so I would suggest, in this instance, to ring them and find out, because uh, I had a quick look at that. It looks a very new disc. It's, it, came, but, it was all wrapped up. I bought a pack of 10. It was yeah. wrapped in everything, so, yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I, would, I would be ringing them and finding out for sure, because to me that expired in 2018. Mm, that, that, that's my initial reaction, um, and, I, and I will definitely seek validation of that. Um, if that's the case, I might be able to whittle some more discs out of them. Who knows? We'll see. <laughs> yeah, but, 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 but hey, there, there is some good news. Uh, none of them have exploded yet, and they're actually, again, all, as always, really good discs. I, I, I am trying to also source some, um, some slightly finer grit ones for cleaning up duty before painting, so um, I'll see if they've got some... Uh, I don't know, 120 grit or 180 grit flap discs. Uh, I'll have to find yeah, you out. Could, you could definitely get them. I think the, the finer grit you can get in a flat wheel is 320, if memory serves me. Oh, cool. So, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. Um, the, the beautiful part with flat wheels is they're sort of, they're not as dangerous if they explode or fall apart like a cutting or grinding discus. No, I, I, I can speak from experience with that. Definitely not as dangerous. I've had a few yes. blow up on me um, for doing yep. stupid things and, and dropping grinders and then carrying on. Yes. What a yes. numpty, eh? <laughs> mm -hmm. Everybody's done it, mate. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a dangerous practice if you're for people out there running workshops. It's also mm. the things you need to be aware, aware of in stock rotation because... Yeah, definitely, definitely. Because if you had an employee get injured because of a disc being out of date and, and, and failing, then as an employer, you'd, you'd be liable initially. And, you know? and well, yes, definitely. But if you've got good practices in place and chase it back to the company that supplied you, if they supplied you out of date discs, mm, yeah. If it's been on your, just as responsible. Yeah, if it's been sat on sat at the back of your shelf for a couple of years, then it, it's the employer's problem. But if it's if it's just been delivered or it's within its date, it, you know, if it um, if it's been supplied out of date recently, then yeah, it, then then certainly you can pass the buck without a doubt. Yes, definitely, definitely. But I'll let you get back to the show. I hope that answers your question. It does, and stay tuned because we're going to be covering a bit on your go kart now. Just while you're on. What what brand yes. what brand and model of go kart is it again? Because I've completely forgotten. It's uh, Dingo by Manco. Dingo by Manco. Okay, and it's from, yeah. the, from the states, the right? Go -Kart. It's from the states. Yeah, from America. Yeah. America. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I better I better yeah. I better I better just um uh, you know use some of that um what do they call it sanitization stuff on it in case it's got the COVID, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. It's, it's been in New Zealand for a long time, but yeah, probably. 
probably still a good idea to spray it in. <laughs> no worries, matey. Well, so I'm going to be covering some basics of that during this live stream as, a, as an intro. So um, if, if I get anything wrong, you can feel free to chip in on the on the comments. Uh, I think you'll get it all all well, all good. Oh, we'll try. All right, Jared. All thank, right. Thanks for your time. I'll let you get back to your uh, to your live stream. <laughs> Beautiful. Love your work. All right, matey. Cheers. See ya. Bye. Bye. There you go, a spontaneous phone call. Thank you very much for your time, Jared. Really appreciate it. And of course, all the support that you give the Andy Mechanic YouTube channel as well, because it, it, it really is very much appreciated. Um, and we're gonna cover some Forge stuff as well during this video, actually, during this live stream. Um, now, back to the comments. Dum, dum, dum. Oh, I, no, one more thing, one more thing. I have a grinding disc here. Now, this I definitely bought in New Zealand because I, 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 I'd run out of, um, we brought a lot of, of grind discs from the UK because Ben was putting all the tools together and he saw a big stack of them, so he brought them with us. This is a CGW disc. Um, again, another good brand. And it looks like that one expires, there we are, look, sorry camera, in 2021. So I've got plenty of time to use those up. But again, I'm, I'm conscious now, I'm aware, so I can, I can manage it, which is great. Thank you, Jared. So there you go, cutting discs. If you've got them in your garage, check the date, especially especially on the slit discs, because I think they're really important that they don't explode on you. Mmm. Coffee's gone really cold. Now then, where's my, um, where's my ashtray? I did bring an ashtray out here somewhere. I don't know where it is. Oh, it's under my phone. Look. <laughs> Brand placement, look at that. <laughs> Cheers, Jared. Um, right, so where are we? What's next? Comments. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Jim Haynes, I had some UK made Brittle, King Dick, and Sykes Pickerman stuff. Sykes is great, I really like the Sykes Pickerman stuff. Uh, before some of them uh, went to rebranding imports, I know King Dick is the only UK made mechanics tool that I know of. That's interesting stuff now. A lot of, uh, a lot of tools have been, you know. The manufacturer's been sent abroad to try and save costs, I suppose. Um, but the big concern is, does it affect the quality? And in many cases, it does, unfortunately. Quality control, when you're having things manufactured off-site, is one of the biggest problems. Um, I do have somewhere a King Dick spanner. I know I do. don't know where it is. I have used it. I think it's a 10 millimeter one. I have used it. Yeah, I've still got it. I haven't lost it. It's not a socket. Um, Pingu, hello. Is there any chance Tool Girl Jade comes back? There is a possibility. I did uh, get hold of Tool Girl Jade only a few weeks ago, and she's delighted to come back on the show. Uh, however, at the moment, she's at uh, university and she's got some pretty serious exams uh, and papers to finish at the moment. Uh, once that's out of the way and, and that's been delayed because of the, the problems within her education because of the COVID. Uh, once that's finally out of the way, and she's hoping by the end of the year, she will definitely come back on the channel. It'd be great to have Jade back. I do like Jade. Good fun. Simon, the only reason I know about the date on grinding discs is my wife used to work in a place that supplied that type of stuff. I was shocked as you. Yeah, I had no idea that they expired. Uh, and I think it's you know really important. And, and if I do any any more videos in the future... Um, on fabrication or you know, using a grinder or a cutting disc or whatever, um, then I will definitely mention it in those videos as well because um, not many people know. And I think you need to know. It's a really important issue and the suppliers don't tell you about it. Um, you know, I'll certainly question when I go and buy more discs. I'll actually question the counter staff. Um, what, what do these numbers mean on the, on the middle and see if they even know. Um, it will be interesting to find out. Jim K, I would run them if they're I would run them if they're flap discs. Yes, if they're out of date and they were flap discs, not that they would last that long in my workshop, to be honest. But yeah, I, yeah, I think as long as you wore a full face mask, you should be all right. Um, just be careful, and if it starts to disintegrate, stop. You'll feel an unbalance on the tool anyway if, it, if that happens. Uh, Jim K, never heard of that go kart brand. Uh, me neither, and I've already was it was it a dingo, wasn't it a dingo? was the model. Jim Haynes, did Jared give you a thumbs up? <laughs> he better do, he'd be in trouble if he hasn't. 
Simon, uh, the tool the tool we have not seen for a long time is the magic hammer. Da da, the magic hammer. Hang on, then I'll go and get the magic hammer. Sorry, Simon. Let's go get the magic hammer. Now then, the old magic hammer was in use last night, believe it or not. It gets used all the time. And um, it's, it's quite a sacred hammer, really. It's, it's, it's not quite as good as Thor's hammer, obviously, but it, it's full of unicorn blood. And uh, it's looking very tired. I think it needs refreshing. Um, but finding the old unicorn blood is hard to come by. But yeah, I know you can, I know you can buy different ends for them. You can buy new ends and stuff, and I, will, I do need to buy new ends for it. Um, but it is original shaft original head and it's not often you get that on a hammer this one is probably geez it's had a bit of a, a bit of a beating look i've obviously missed what i've been hitting a few times um this one is probably about 15 years old so it's done extremely well and it's had some serious abuse it really has you can see by the end of it all peened over look because when these are new the copper is it's quite long it's quite a fair section it's just quite a lot of the material has broken away and it's it's probably got to the point now where it's not really working as well as it should do because it's very close now to the, the cast iron part. And the same goes with the hide end as well. Look, it's completely worn out. So Magic Hammer, looking sad, needs some love. I'll do that. I'll put it on my list of things to do. <laughs> Hopefully that's uh, giving you your fix there, Simon. Uh, Jim K, I found some tool... I found some tool from an ATV toolkit that had an ATV manufacturer's name on them. Very cool. You won't get that anymore. Um, Pingu, thanks for your answer, Andy. Keep up the good work. I will. Thank you very much. Duke of the Dales. Good morning, Duke of the Dales. Good morning, Andy. Uh, Rodney Long, Jr. Hi, Andy, from across the pond, um, Missouri, USA. Uh, good morning, Rodney. Great to have you on board, sir. We've got 40, 42 viewers and 23 likes, so there's a slight discrepancy there. If you haven't clicked the like button yet, I suppose you could do it now if you want. I See, I, I'm learning how to run a live stream. Look at that. You've already got some more likes. It's great. Uh, what brand is the Magic Hammer? I don't know. I actually don't know. I just know it's a number two. Because th obviously Thor's Hammer is number one, and this is the second this is number two. I, I don't know. I bought it decades ago. A long time ago. I don't know what brand it is. I didn't know you could get different brands. I think it, I think it came with a sticker on it, and the sticker went a long time ago. Um, but lots of places sell them. But they're not cheap, actually. They're not they're here in New Zealand. They're actually pretty expensive. Um, Simon Roll. Thor. <laughs> Richie, mate. Morning, Andy. Good morning, Richie. Right. Quick swig of cold coffee. We've, I think we've exhausted the grinder stuff. Uh, oh, just a quick update on the toolbox stickers. I know, they're good, aren't they? There you go, look, these are the sheets. I'll be sending out one of these to each of you that have asked uh, uh, via email. Um, I'm busy collating the list. There's quite a few to go out, I must admit. Um, and Mrs. Mechanic is going to get all that done next week, so uh, they'll be in the post at the very latest by the end of next week. Um, apologies for it being a bit late. Uh, I was hoping to get them away this week and be spontaneous, um, but of course the fabrication job that I've done uh, has really taken some time. So we need to have a little walk around, don't we? Hang on, let me move some stuff out of the way and we'll steal the camera. Just take it off charge. Dum, dum, dum. Uh, there you go. Right. Okay. Turning the camera around, three, two, one. Still with us? Okay, right, quick walk around. So this, first of all, an update on the fabrication work. Uh, if you saw the post on Instagram, you've already seen this. Uh, last night's job was to make these little spaces and these go in there, look like that, for the center, center bolt. And oh, one, honestly, one-handed stuff is terrible. Hang on, hang on. I, Andy can do better than this. Let me just, there we are, look, right, okay, perfect. Okay, so, look at this, very cool. Right, so these, these spaces go in there, that one goes in there, that goes on top. There's some nice stainless steel countersunk M8s going there, M8x30s that go in there, and then these are M10s that go through the chassis of the vehicle. There's some existing, well, there's a bit of um, C-channel that runs over the top of this bracket, 
and there's the four mounts there. And then on the outside of the chassis, these go on. You can see both, you can, look at that. Good, good camera work, Andy. There's obviously two more plates on the far side, and these provide additional support to the top shock mounts uh, on the front of the chassis. Um, so there you go, that's what I've been busy doing. Uh, these, uh, incidentally, were laser cuts, but I did have to tidy them up because there were some quite sharp edges on them. And there's 60 of these. It took me bloody ages to clean all these up, honestly. Um, but these, originally, the first batch that I made, I um, I got some, some just some round bar and made them in the lathe. It took me bloody ages um, because the thickness is critical. It has to be exactly the same thickness as the flat plate spacers. Obviously, otherwise there's going to be a bow and it's not going to fit properly in the in the C section on the chassis. Huh. So in the end, I thought, oh, revelation! I'll just use a hole saw, cut them out with the hole saw, and then finish them up on the lathe. So they're actually made out of exactly the same plate of these spacers. So obviously the same thickness. So pretty good. Very happy with those. Right now, go kart. Let's go have a look at this go kart. Dum dum dum. Okay. So this is. Jared's, he's, he's obviously watching this now. Hi, Jared. Um, this is Jared's go-kart that he bought for his kids. And uh, the plan was, as every, or most fathers tend to do, uh, they want to do something up and let the kids ride it around. And part of the process of doing it up with the kids was for them to appreciate the amount of work that goes into something like this. Um, and, you know, just to appreciate the buggy overall. But when, when Jared got into it, he found, he's got it all stripped down, he found some pretty serious corrosion going on which is pretty normal for New Zealand. Things do tend to rust over here quite a bit. So we're going to have to replace some of the tubing. Um, so I'll have to get a little pipe bender. My big pipe bender, my hydraulic pipe bender is still in the UK, unfortunately, so I haven't got access to that anymore. Um, so we're going to replace part of this tube and we're going to replace this tube here. Now, my concern, and from an engineering perspective, I can't quite get my head around it, why this tube here, the one that finishes just before the joint, doesn't actually go all the way to the joint. It probably be down to a manufacturing um, you know, ease of speed, um, whereas I think when we replace this, we'll actually make it a nice joint and, and get a nice weld line going down there, just to beef up this area here. I have looked at the frame, and it is, it is very slightly bent, and it has bent on this joint here, but this area. So there's obviously the weakest point. Uh, so we're going to beef that up slightly. So we've got, uh, I think, part of this one to replace. And this. And this. And the floor. Can I turn it over that without falling over? I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, the, the floor's pretty. You can see it's pretty rusty. So we're going to replace that plate as well. I think we're going to make that plate so it's a bolt-in plate. As opposed to welding. Um, just for ease of maintenance and that kind of stuff you can see it's got some pretty big sort of rust holes going on down there and we might need to replace some of the stuff at the front as well because again there's some pretty deep pop marks in here so i think some of this if not all of this will get replaced now it's it's quite significant the amount of tubing and of course um that, that, well, that needs to be replaced and of course if we're not careful, we're going to lose some of the geometry um, and shape and precision of the chassis. So the original plan is I'm going to make a jig out of some box section. Uh, and that jig will mount, It'll this chassis will then sit at critical points on that jig. So that when I put the new tubing in, I can uh, I can realign it properly. There's I've just, just read in the comments as we go, there's nothing wrong at all with the rear end. It, there's There's really no corrosion at the back end at all. So making a whole new chassis is probably an even bigger job. So I think, you know, as long as I address the corrosion from that here onwards and uh, replace, obviously, these little plates here all, you know, there's not a lot of strength going on there anymore. And we may even fit a complete plate all the way across. This is where the seat bolts in, um, just to beef it up. But remember, it is only a kid's buggy. This isn't for adults, Jared. This isn't for adults, this is for kids. And I think Jared said he has sat in it, but it's pretty tight. I probably wouldn't even be able to get in this buggy, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the rest of the corrosion, it's just, this is just surface stuff. It'll clean up quite well. But the main, the main corrosion area is down here. So this is going to be 
a project. Oh, look, CB750. Mm. Anyway, um, so yeah, it's going to be a project for the future. We've, we've also got to fit, as you can see, there's no engine. Uh, the engine blew up. So Jared is going to source a replacement engine, which we may have to alter the drivetrain slightly. This plate might have to move some, you know, might have to move forwards or backwards or whatever. And I'll probably come up with some kind of a design for a chain tensioner as well. Uh, I did fit a different engine. Ben had a similar buggy to this in the UK, a bit, a bit bigger it was. And uh, we fitted a, a 125cc CVT drive engine to his with complete success. It was fantastic. We blew it up with only a few weeks of owning it. Uh, and then we put the um, we put the replacement engine in. It took me a couple of weeks to tinker around doing it. And after that, it ran for years. And it was running fine even when we left the UK. So, oh, What kind of engine? I think Jared's going to use something like a Briggs & Stratton. Probably about a 7 or 8 horse. I'll try and convince him to put a YZ250 two-stroke engine in it. But uh, I think that probably will be a bit too much for his kids, to be honest. <laughs> and we've got tyres. But I, I'm going to speak to some of my mates in the industry. And I think we're going to put some new tyres on it as well. Because I was looking around. Some of these tyres, there was some pretty serious... Yes, there, look, on the rears. Sorry, Ooh, close up. You can see here, look, on the rears, we've got some pretty serious perishing going on as well. So, end of the day, if we're going to do it, let's do it properly, and then it'll last forever, basically, won't it? Very cool. Looking forward to getting into this project. Uh, it's not gonna, I'm not going to be able to start it for another couple of weeks, but uh, once we get into it, it will be awesome. And, and certainly showing people how to make a jig to um to maintain the dimensions and accuracy of a chassis when you're replacing parts i think is going to be a critical part of those videos but also it'd be great to see the kids faces when they get in it for the first time and blast around the garden and start chewing up dad's grass because you know that's exactly what's going to happen jared they're going to make a racetrack out of your garden good luck <laughs> oh what else what else has been going on don't know so a quick scan around the workshop just trying to think of anything. Oh, yes, paint. Oh, it's very weird on the look at that live stream, live stream. Well, hey, go over here, look. Now, paint. Obviously, I have to paint this stuff. And Mrs. McCann was up in Auckland earlier in the week. Now, I think, oh, one-handed again, Andy. What have we got in here? We've got the Forge Black Gloss. I wanted to do gloss because that's the same uh, type of paint or the same you know finish as on the existing chassis on the ROVs because I don't want these to stand out. They're a discreet kind of bracing. So we've got the standard black gloss which we've used on all sorts of stuff around the workshop. But Jared said to me, uh, Jared said, "Hey Andy, Forge do a primer as well. Do you want some of that?" So I said, "Hey, yeah, I think we should do this time round." So. We've got here Rust Stop Primer from Forch L239. I've never used this before. I'm really looking forward to how it's going to improve the finish even more, and especially the durability of the paint, um, because these, these braces have to work in a really harsh environment. And the last thing I want is them to start uh, start corroding up. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, the paint without the primer in the workshop, you can see we've done it on the, although it's the satin finish, you know, we did it on, the, on this racking. Man, it came out. It came out really, really well. I mean, it's, okay, it's dusty now. I've been grinding for the last the last week, but uh, it came out extremely well. Very happy with that. And that's. I think there's two coats on there. Uh, the gloss. I actually used the gloss on that last pair of angle iron. That's the that's the nasty hammerite stuff. And uh, sorry, I can't get you much more of a close up on that. Uh, and that's the the forge. And so quick at drying. Honestly, for a workshop, it's brilliant really is right i'm going to turn you back around and we'll carry on oh look at that so i might need to adjust the camera a little bit hang on bear with me oh well look at that you've got nothing but lights right we've got 48 viewers oh just for those uh, out of interest and jared may have already noticed but can you notice the very strategically placed can of brake cleaner now that's, yes, it's product placement, I, I understand that, but it's also screening something on the Forge calendar that really can't show on YouTube, so I need to make sure that that's accurately uh, aligned. Right, where are we? 
Simon, just make a new chassis, lol. I, I could do that, but then it wouldn't be a restoration project, would it? It would be, Andy's made a new chassis. <coughs> oh, oh, Daz32323 is asking how he gets one of the um, Toolbox Tool Girl stickers. Well, Daz, just for you, mate, and I know I did put a deadline on getting your emails through. And there's already a lot of emails come through for these stickers, and I, I, I think I've got just enough. If you send me an email through today and tell me um, why you watch the Andy Mechanic YouTube channel, and if you'd like to see any changes, and if, if you were me and this was your channel, how would you, what would you do in the future, you know? Um, now, currently, uh, and also, sorry, also uh, give me your full name and address so I can post your sticker out. Uh, and I'll get one sent out. Now, there's no cost to you. This is out of my own pocket. It's a gift from me to you being a live stream viewer. This is only available to live stream viewers, and it was really only available last week to live stream viewers. But since you've asked, and for anybody else that wasn't watching last week, that is watching this week, if you would like one of those Toolbox Tool Girl stickers, then I'll happily post one out to you. But you need to send me an email, and my email address is andymechanic at live, L-I-V-E dot co dot UK. It's down there in the description. Um, just flick me an email through. Tell me uh, the three main reasons why you watch the channel. Uh, number one being the most important, obviously. And then just a brief description of, of, you know, things that you would like to see in the channel in the future, basically. Uh, and I'll send you a sticker. Easy as that, really. But no... You know, if you're going to do it, please get it sent today because I'll be collating that uh, that spreadsheet of all the emails for Mrs. Mechanic at some point tomorrow. And if you're not on the spreadsheet, you're not going to get a sticker. Simple as that. Uh, Connor K, I don't know about the expiration dates. Uh, I doubt most hardware building supply shops knew either. I, I agree, Connor. I've never come across it myself. As a result, that shock won't get pulled from the, sorry, that stock won't get pulled from the shelves and will be sold to unsuspecting customers. Correct. That's right. That's exactly right. And if, the, if the, the shop themselves don't, or the staff at the shop don't even know themselves, then, um, well, it's a recipe for disaster, isn't it? They, they obviously have an obligation to be aware of that kind of stuff. And um, if they've got old stock, to bin it, I suppose, or give it away, or, or I suppose just bin it because it's expired. Um... Simon, yeah, just making a chassis. Anna. Jim K, what kind of engine? Well, <laughs> Simon RD125LC, that would be fun. It would. Uh, that's the kind of engine that I'd like. Two stroke, nice light power plants, good power to weight ratio, simple to maintain, fast, super fast, big rev range on it. Um, yeah, but this is for little kids. Little kids, not big kids like you and me. So um, I think the, the old Briggs and Stratton motor, you know. Cheap to buy, cheap to maintain, easy to maintain, simple, you know, lawnmower style engine. I think that'll do for now, to be honest. Uh, I, I've already mentioned to Jared about our different engines and stuff, and we both very quickly came to the same conclusion that these are little kids and they need to be able to drive it around with relative safety. I mean, it's going to go fast enough for them as it is. Um, Jim. Chicago rawhide used to make hammers like that, but now the SKF bought CR seals no longer make or sell them. Really? Holy shit. Jim Haynes, how about a TZ 750? Come on, Jim. <laughs> I've got to be sensible about it. Uh, Roger, I have a Honda Nivida 400 motor here if you want it for the kids, for the kids' cart. Oh, 400 cc. I don't think the chassis will cope with the 400, Roger. I think it would fold it up. Um, <laughs> too big, too big. NV400, yep. Oh, that's spell check. Okay, NV400. Okay, that'll be a V twin, won't it? NV400? I don't know. Uh, Jim K, what is causing the need for the bracing? I haven't seen that issue here. Bracing. You mean on the chassis where it's where it's just slightly bent? Uh, oh no, sorry. You mean the the fabrication job? I can't tell you, Jim. I can't tell you. It's a secret. Um, but given your background and the access that you have, without giving anything away, 
if you speak to your service manager and get to look on the portal, can't say too much, you might find some information on it. And yes, it has happened in your country. It has. I know it has. Uh, Marius Olaru, you sure you want to post to the UK because I'm tempted to email you? Yes, I'll post anywhere in the world. Um, the YouTube channel has done extremely well during the month of August. Um, revenue, I mean, I, I'm pretty open about this. I'm not going to tell you what it earns, but it has increased quite a bit. Whether that's directly down to COVID or the fact that people are enjoying the videos more and there's, there's a lot more new viewers coming to the channel. Um, I'm happy to roll some of that back in and say thank you to you, the viewers. So, not a problem. There's quite a few going to the UK already, so another one won't harm, will it? Uh, so, Marius, send me the email, but do also tell me why you like to watch the channel. Um, and like I've said before, you know, um, there's many different ways that viewers can support the channel and, and, and give a little bit back. And I'm not just talking about finances, you know. Jim and many others, uh, and there's quite a few patrons as well, do donate and have donated. Some donate on a regular basis every month through the Patreon page. Um, and others do a one-off donation. And for all of those people, thank you very much. It, it makes what I do possible. Um, but there are other ways. And one of the easiest ways that you can help to, to you know, support the channel is to promote the channel. You've, most of you have got Facebook or Instagram. You know, share one of my posts. Tell your mates about it. Spread the word. Because the more views that the videos get uh, and the more minutes watched, that in itself creates more revenue and helps me to do what I do. And as revenue increases over the years, the budget to do things will improve uh, and it'll give me more flexibility. Uh, and I can, I can tell you now, hand on heart, wherever it is, do I have a heart somewhere in there? I have spent way more on the channel to date than it has ever earned. Uh, whether that's through Patreon, through YouTube earnings, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever support has come in. I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking about the value of the of the donations and support from companies like Fortune Ten Tools. That's that's a little bit different. Um, but the, the 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 monetary value that's come in, I have without a doubt spent a lot more on the workshop and other bits and pieces. And yes, it's mine, and it's going to be here forever. So you know, looking long term, that's where I'll get to benefit from it. But Short term, you know, I'm happy to spend the money on various projects. I mean, I've, I've just, Tall Girl Holly's farm bike, she's coming down, she's confirmed, she's coming down the end of this month, last weekend of September, two days of filming. Um, and we've purchased quite a few genuine Suzuki parts for the bike that we needed. Um, in fact, swing arm bearings, couldn't even get them after market. Um, the suspension bearing kit, couldn't get them after market. Uh, had to go genuine at the moment because of the part supply problems. Um, probably spent in parts between the aftermarket parts and the genuine, uh, and the foot pegs are pretty expensive to be honest because it needed new foot pegs. There's probably, don't tell Mrs. Mechanic, it's probably a thousand New Zealand dollars in parts coming for that bike. So we're going to do it up, make it look really nice, uh, and, and all the mechanical problems will be fixed. And then she can go ride it, take it down to Woodhill. And she can have a blast around Woodhill on it and we'll do a bit of filming. It'd be great fun. And maybe, if I can twist Tall Girl Lily's arm, maybe Tall Girl Lily will join us as well. It'd be a great fun day out. I think she might. I'll try. I'll, I'll, I'll try and charm her. How's that? Now, uh, bu -bu 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 right, Connor, about the cart, Lewis Hamilton got his start in one of in one and look how he has worked out it's worked out for him he did he started off with go-kart racing didn't he as quite a few formula one drivers do they start with kart racing and work their way up um i remember when i was at college there was a young lad in, in our class that was doing go-kart racing and um he he got onto a it wasn't a formula one team obviously but it was it was you know he'd certainly progressed even during the two-year course he'd already progressed and moved on from go-karts and was was racing you know much bigger um, formula type cars bloody it was just incredible really how his career took off so quick he was obviously a good driver clearly uh, Jim K the cart needs a thousand cc with a five speed Jim it doesn't it doesn't have you seen how weedy those little chassis rails are a thousand cc engine would just destroy it in seconds um, uh, just to let you know Jim K the, the new model that's just come out 
um, by the manufacturer that I can't mention on my videos um, is definitely, I've just got to choose the color. It's definitely going to go in the workshop without a doubt. But before I do that, I want to try and negotiate with my employer the ability to do some videos on it. Um, mainly driving videos so I can take you guys out on the track with the GoPro and we can go and have a bit of fun and see how it performs. I can't wait to get my hands on one of those. It's not going to happen until the early part of next year but because I've got a lot of saving up to do. It's pretty expensive. But Mrs. Mechanic has already given me the thumbs up as long as she can drive it as well. So there you go. I'm a real, real supporter of that brand. I really am. I, I love those machines. Jim Haynes. One thing I notice about Teng Tools is they don't seem to offer long or extra long style ratchets uh, like a lot of others yet. Hmm, they do. Hang on, bear with me. I've got one. Now, I had the same problem because I, I like long, uh, long leverage, you know, long handle ratchets. And um, eventually on the website, I found this. Now, it is a half inch. I'd have preferred a three eighths, and I will get a three eighths as soon as I bring one out. It's a half inch, swivel head, and the bar is probably about, it's probably about 400 millimeters from here to the end of the handle. Uh, it's really good for doing up, you know, wheel nuts and bits and pieces, uh, although I do finish them off with a torque wrench. Um, you know, rear axles on motorcycles, front axles on motorcycles. It, it, it's great for that kind of stuff. Really, really do like it. I've been using it quite a bit. Very happy with it. Um, but I don't think they do a 3 8 one. If if you come across a Tang Tools 3 8 please let me know the part number and I'll get it ordered. But I have been searching. Haven't found it yet. I'll ask Brandon when I see him next. Uh, Mike Bosansky, you dieting, no meat pie. I know, I didn't go to the petrol station yesterday. And there was no time this morning to go anywhere, so that didn't happen. So I'll have to wait for my breakfast. But we, I did spot some bacon in the fridge, so there'll be a bacon butty coming my way a bit later on. Jim K, I would love to see the New Zealand country from one of those machines. There's quite a few events around New Zealand now for ROVs. Um, there's, there's obviously the racing event. There's a t what's called the Taupo 1000, I think it is. Uh, there's another one up in Woodhill. Um, just phenomenal events. I mean, they're, they're, they are full-out racing events and something which uh, I won't be getting involved with because I would just kill myself, um, probably, or seriously, hurt, seriously injure myself, and I, I can't afford the time off work. Um, but for the new model that's come out, it looks perfect. It's got plenty of power and lots of suspension travel, and some nice big tyres, lots of clearance. Sort of takes me back more to the four-wheel driving stuff that I used to do in the UK, but with a bit more performance, a bit more lightweight, and far, far superior suspension. So be a nice, smoother ride. That's the one thing with the four-wheel drives, especially on the leaf springs, is it's a, it's a hell of a bumpy ride inside. So, um, yeah, looking forward to that. And I might have to sell a couple of motorcycles to do it. But... Um, Hey, needs must. And, I, and it will only just fit in the workshop. I can get one ROV in here and all the bikes. Just. And I mean only just. I'm even considering moving the lights above this main workbench to the other side of the brackets or making some new brackets and mounting them further up in the roof. And then I can get one of the quad bikes that I've got. I've got a couple of um, YFM 350 Raptors, Road Legal. When the workshop gets really full, I can actually put one of the quad bikes up on the bench uh, to gain some more floor space. Uh, and I can also stand the ATVs up on their end as well. Um, that, again, gives me more floor space if need be, but it's not. I don't like to do that because it, obviously all the gearbox, all, all the engine oil runs to the back of the engine. And if you leave them for too long like that, then you, we actually had a problem where fourth gear, I think it was fourth gear driven, um, ben was riding one of the Warriors years ago in the UK that had been stood on its end for a few months. Took it around the field and the gear seized to the shaft and he only got, he could only obviously at that point have fourth gear because you've got gearbox lock in any other gear. So I don't like doing it. I don't. Uh, Simon Roll, the brand, the, that brand is my favourite brand of motorcycle. 
but don't have one at the minute though. Well, Simon, you need to sort that problem out. You need to get yourself a little project. There's plenty of them around. Ben likes the TDR250s, and there's still a few of them in the UK, but parts are getting quite hard to find now. Jim K was supposed to have ours this week. Didn't happen. Maybe next week. Well, they are already going out. Simon, ooh, I do, lol. Forgot about the one in the boxes. <laughs> There's always one somewhere on the shed floor. Well, Simon, get it built up. Be great to see that one done. Send me some, send me some photos of what you've got at the moment and the, the state of play. Uh, Jim K, wow, that really tells me the size of your workshop. If one of them would barely would barely fit. Um, no, no, I, I can get if I don't have any bikes in here, I could probably get three, three ROVs in and still have a bit of space. Um, but there's a lot of bikes. A lot of bikes coming here in the night time and, and three ATVs, so it takes up a lot of floor space. But now that the wall's down and the lights are higher up and stuff, there, there is a bit of spare room and I've got more bikes now than I've ever had in the workshop. So um, thank God for all the space we've created. And it has made a huge difference. It's so much better now as the workshop. Uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't think that just the small changes that I've made um, would give you so much more floor space, but it has done. John Dyer. Hi, Andy. Hope you're well. Hi, John. Uh, your miss is back. I hope she is, and well, too. She is. She came back on the Tuesday, back down from Auckland. I gave her a few collections to do on the way down, which was very good. Uh, saved me having to go out and get them, and uh, meant that I could stay at home and crack on with that project, that fabrication project. And of course, you know, cover my day job as well. I have lots of emails coming through and phone calls and stuff, so that, that slows me down tremendously, but you know, I can work around it and I've got to give my day job priority. End of the day, that's what pays the bills. And that's what I'm paid to do. End of the day. Jim Haynes. Do they still race speedway bikes in New Zealand? Yes, they do. Here in the US, it was really big for a while, making a huge comeback in the 70s though early, uh, the, through early 90s. But it's faded to mainly a small regional series. Um, a good friend of mine, Kevin, down in Invercargill, he runs a, a motorcycle dealership. Um, from what I remember, we, we were talking one night at his house. He has, he has a really nice workshop, a uh, big barn. Um, he used to race Speedway. And then he got on to doing um, quad racing, ATV racing. Uh, he has a Banshee all set up for an oval circuit, which I think he's trying to sell. So I'll have to let Ben know. It'd be good to get his hand, our hands on that and get it get it put back to... I mean, the engine's obviously highly tuned, but the... the um, He's changed the, the A-arms and stuff on it to make it more stable on an oval circuit. Um, so we'll probably put that back to standard. We'll get some standard A-arms and stuff for it and put it back. But uh, Ben's always wanted a Banshee. He has, and, and so have I, to be honest. Uh, and that one has got a lot of history because it's won some championships here in New Zealand. So it'd be great to have it on board. But whether I can twist Kevin's arm and be able to buy it off him and it not be too expensive as well, uh, I just that's yet to be seen. Um, Jim Haynes, are you are you waiting on parts for the Honda Four? I am. I went through the parts box of all the stuff that had arrived, and um, <clears throat> the new ignition coils haven't turned up yet, and the electronic ignition pickup hasn't turned up yet either. Uh, although the coils are now at the dealership that I've ordered them through, good friend of mine, uh, MCR Motorcycle Replacements down in Dunedin, he's. Um, He's organising it all for us. Rick and, and Rachel, his wife, um, good team down there. Uh, they're very passionate about motorcycles, which is good. That's why one of the reasons why they, why they got the deal, to be honest. I like to support people that are, are passionate about the brand. Um, the ignition pickups coming from, I believe, from the States. So that should, should be here any day now. Um, but in the parts that have arrived, the replacement um, points, because I am going to fit points initially to do some testing that I can then uh, you know, and put the ignition system back to standard in good order, do some testing on the HT voltage, on the high tension voltage, and then take it all off and then fit the electronic ignition and see how that improves not only ignition timing accuracy, we can use the scope for that, um, but also does it actually improve spark voltage as well which is what they claim especially during cold start it'd be a really good i think really good video series uh, and one which will hopefully prove uh, the benefits um, that are written on the box of the new parts basically 
the benefits of um, you know more accurate ignition and um, and better spark voltage. It'll it'll be a final conclusion as to why you know manufacturers have moved to that uh, that type of ignition system. Uh, on the on you know on obviously now their ECU control, but during that period of time. Um, so yeah, Jim, in the parts box there were no new condensers, just points. I did order new condensers, didn't turn up, uh, and they can't get them. So I'm going to have to spread the feelers out a bit further to try and get a pair of condensers. Um, first off, I need to go back to the Honda manual and find out what the rating is for the condensers and then see if I can just order a couple of condensers of that rating as opposed to order condensers for that particular bike. Oh, it all gets a bit complicated, doesn't it? But I'm sure we'll work our way through it. Um, but at the moment, I've been way too busy. I was doing all the racking and now I have this fabrication project. Had to be, it was urgent, had to be done. Uh, this afternoon, um, we're going to be, me and Mrs. Mechanic are going to do some more work on the carport because I can't do any more to the fabrication project, uh, these brackets, until my new tool arrives, which was on next day delivery, was sent out on Wednesday, still hasn't turned up. Hopefully it'll be here Monday. And then I can do some more to them in the afternoon. Jim K, have you ever been to a MotoGP race? Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I have, years and years ago. Uh, I've been to quite a few uh, motorcycle racing events, be it motocross, be it track. Um, I went to, we had obviously Oliver's Mount in Scarborough. I've been there a few times over the years. Uh, Castle Donington, I went to go and see um, the John Player special uh, Norton Rotary racing around there. Was it Was it Ron Haslam that was riding it? God, it's a long time ago now. Um, thoroughly enjoyed that. I was only about 15 or 16 years old at the time, so... Uh, going back a long time, so my my apologies if I got the rider wrong. I'm sure it was Ron Haslam, um, but uh, nothing, nothing at all recently. Nothing. I, I watch it on TV now and again, but yes, we do have racing here in New Zealand. But I, those the weekends that it's on, I use. I'm already already usually booked up with other stuff to do. Um, I've got a load of ROVs. Oh, the, they've given the the go ahead to make a start on the under ceiling of those ROVs. So. All that kicks off, picking the first two up on Thursday. So next weekend, I'll be busy doing that. Isle of Man. I've been to the Isle of Man. I have. You reminded me. I've been to the Isle of Man. Went there for a week. Took a Honda CM200 Twin. Little tiny custom bike thing from Honda. And had a great time riding the track on that. Everything was faster than me. I wasn't trying to go fast anyway. Thing didn't handle at all. Had Mrs. Mechanic on the back. Um, yeah, even then. Long time ago. Uh, although, I don't, think we were, I don't think we were married at the time. No, we wouldn't have been married, I don't think. But, um, well, were we? Can't remember. Maybe just before we got married. Jim Haynes. Those guys are really on the edge of disaster. Man, yeah, it's, it's just a given that one of the riders never makes it home after the TT, isn't it? Every year somebody passes away, one of the riders. Um... It takes some pretty big balls to do what they do. And the speeds, every year, the speeds just get faster and faster and faster. It's incredible. Guy Martin races there, doesn't he? He's uh, he's a thrill seeker for sure, that guy. Does some good videos as well. Simon, just looked up the condensers are listed on eBay UK. Cheap too. Awesome! Thank you, Simon. You are a legend. I really need to get those ordered because that's that really is starting to hold up the, the ignition system videos. Um, there's still other, other work to do on the bike. There's the front brake caliper I want to pull off. That'll be the next video. Pull that off and uh, and take a look at those bushes. Uh, I have been told that, that that lift on the caliper is normal for that particular bike. But for me, I'm just not happy with it. I think it's, I think it's excessive. I want to take a look at the bushes and see if they've overlated in any way. If they have, then I'll make up some new bushes and put them in there. Uh, thanks, Simon. Yes, please do, and I can get those ordered. That'd be great. Thank you for that. Uh, I've not been on eBay UK for many years, so it'd be good. It might might even give me some specs on the condensers as well. Uh, Jim K, that guy is awesome, the way he talks. He doesn't give a shit, does he? And he still does his day job. He's still a, a HGV mechanic. Um, you know, he's a um, very humble chap, but, you know, does some amazing stuff. And a very, very clever engineer as well. Very clever guy. I do like to uh, to watch his videos. He inspires me tremendously. 
good old Guy Martin. A legend in his own time. Yeah. Oh, hang on. Uh, Jim K. The guy is awesome, the way he talks. Yes, Jim Haynes. Lots of corners named after the after riders that didn't make it. Yeah, yeah. Testament to the riders. And, um, you know, nice in some ways that they named some corners after them, but it would be a lot nicer to have those riders still here. They just push themselves and their bikes right to the edge of the of the, of the limits and when you're riding like that it only takes the slightest mistake or the slightest thing to go wrong and there's no coming back oh awesome thank you simon i need to take a picture of that hang on dum 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 where's my phone honestly I'm terrible, Anna, really, taking pictures of screens. Only my generation could do that. Any, anybody younger than me would just take a screenshot of the laptop. It's just easy, and it? it works. And it's in my phone now. I can't lose it. Well, where are we? What have we done? We've talked about dates on slit disks and grinding disks and flat disks and stuff. With, I think the most important part of today, which maybe wasn't that entertaining, but hopefully uh, spurred a bit of conversation and, and thought, at least, is the paddle switch grinders that are coming out now and the problems that I have and maybe you will have as well in actually using them and um, they become I think quite cumbersome and awkward to use compared to the old on off switch type grinders um, yeah a bit of a problem but um, you know it's just the way it is isn't it you know the the world is becoming so safety conscious nowadays that you know, essentially, it's going to take a lot longer to do the same job with a grinder like that than it would be the old school grinder. I, I, I know it would do for me anyway. Um, and the longer things take, the more costs are involved and things just spiral out of control. It's a classic example of, of health and safety causing inflated costs in production. And, um, you know, probably another reason why manufacturers will start to outsource into countries uh, for manufacturing purposes that don't have the same regulations that we have here in New Zealand or in the UK, you know, to try and keep costs down. Um, and then, of course, we lose more jobs. It's not good. Jim Haynes, I still tell people, if you ever want to hear a, mot a motor, just, just saying, give up a break, give me a break, it's going flat up the mountain at full RPM, flat out. Yeah, it's pretty impressive isn't it <laughs> very cool so any more questions before we sign off because I'd like to uh, make a start on the old carport really um, now just before we we go uh, if you haven't yet and I, I always do a little plug for these because we've sold so many of them and it's great to get people's uh, photos uh, come through if you haven't yet got your official Andy mechanic mug uh, they are still available for sure uh, via the Zazzle website. And again, there's a link in the description down the bottom. Um, there's lots of different choices. There's, um, what have we got here? We've got, we've got Tool Girl mugs. That's Holly looking extremely gorgeous as always. Um, you can order, you know, whatever you like, even a key ring. And, um, you know, send through, once it arrives, send through a selfie uh, or a picture. If you don't want to do a selfie, send a picture of your mug in your workshop or on your workbench or in your toolbox or in, under the bonnet of your car if you haven't got your own workshop or next to your motorbike if you've got a motorcycle um, send it through on an email and uh, I'll put you in the draw to win some Teng tools uh, some forge gear and of course some more Andy Mechanic merch as well which will include hang on I brought it with me hang on I didn't put it on because it was a bit cold this morning but I should have I should have worn it <clears throat> it will include a bespoke Andy Mechanic jacket. Look at that. Very cool. All the same. And these are embroidered. These are not printed. These are proper quality embroidery. And, uh, you know, it's got another one on there. Look on the front. It's got the old Union Jack on there and stuff. It's got the Andy Mechanic logo on the back collar. Just like the shirts. It's exactly the same. But I won't order the jacket until I know who's won and then I can get the right size for you. Very important. Oh, hopefully that's clean enough. Jeez. Um, right, so where are we now? That's probably about it. Any more questions before I go? Thanks, Simon. Appreciate the number. Um, Marius, I have a Hilti 
at work and it has a paddle switch and must say it's more comfortable to use than an on off switch makes you feel like you have a proper grip on the tool is that for grinding how do you find the tool when you're cutting steel whether whether grinders you know at 90 degrees because that's my problem. I, I wouldn't have a problem if I was just grinding stuff and using flat discs so much. But when you're using the tool in that orientation and you've got the, you know, you've got the paddle switch sort of in the vertical plane rather than the horizontal plane, I find that that's, for me, it just doesn't feel natural. Maybe it's because I'm not used to it. Um, but in any case, because the on-off switch ones are still available at the moment, fingers crossed, I'm going to opt for that for sure. Um, I can see why the manufacturers are having to provide paddle switch grinders because here in New Zealand now I've been told um, that it's you know they have to have those now in a commercial environment. Only the domestic users can buy the the old school on off switch type grinders now. Um, obviously they can buy the paddle switch as well, but you don't have to have a paddle switch grinder. And for me, I would prefer the on off switch. There you go. Uh, they're not bad at all. And Hilti, I've not had any Hilti tools, so I can't really comment on that. But they, the the brand name does does instill to me that it's more of a commercial type tool than a domestic type tool. Um, you know, so it should be pretty well made and, and very durable. Jim, too much government uh, overall. Yeah, it's just they're constantly doing risk assessments, aren't they, and seeing where work accidents occur and. You know, obviously there have been a few accidents with grinders and they've thought, well, how can we make this a bit safer? Um, you see, one of the problems, and, and, and I, I, I do catch myself doing it as well, if I have to, if I'm busy using a flap disc, for example, and I'm, I'm, I, need, I need to work, move the workpiece and say it's in the vice, sometimes for speed, I will just put the grinder on the bench and it'll still be running on the bench. Now, I make sure there's nothing else around it. And, I, and, and the way that the bench is, it's got a very slight... This big bench has got a very slight curvature. It's not dead flat. It sags in the middle a little bit. Um, so if the grinder's moving around a bit, it, it can't go off the side of the bench. It tends to stay in the middle because that's the lowest point. Um, obviously, if the, if the bench was very, very you know, completely flat and it was quite narrow, there's a chance the grinder could vibrate off. But it's only on it's only on the bench for maybe four or five seconds, I suppose, while I'm moving the workpiece. Um, but then I suppose you are putting your hand out to pick up the grinder while it's got a spinning disc. And there is a chance, if you're not concentrating, you might put your hand into the disc, which wouldn't be ideal. Oh, there goes the air compressor. I forgot to turn that one off. Damn. John Dyer, uh, learn to drive a one-wheel... What? Learn to drive a one-wheel car, lol. What? <laughs> Jim K. Uh, there is a special place for paddle switches with safety catches. The trash. Yeah, I know, I know where you're coming from, Jim. I do. I, I also understand why they've been developed, but um, for me, I'm not interested. I've survived this long with the old style. I'm, I'm sure I'll be just fine. Marius, yes, it's mostly commercial and for home use, very expensive, but quite high quality. Uh, I have no problems cutting or grinding. I have both Hilti with paddle and Makita on off switch. And I always prefer the Hilti. Well, that's interesting to know. It is. I mean, there's, you know, it isn't just me in the world that uses grinders, and this is only my opinion. Um, it's good to good to know that some people can get used to the paddle switches. Graham McGluckley, what's the centre height of your lathe? Oh, that's a very good question. Hang on. We need to do some measuring. Hang on, I'll take you with me because you're not on the thingy anymore. Let's get a ruler. Hang on. Oh, by the way, they're not going to get the box back, are they? <laughs> right, centre height, centre height, a little bit of a flat plate, here we go, look. Oh, I've got to be careful now, I'm getting really close to the forged calendar. Uh, wrong one, this one, here we go, look, so it's... Um, I would say it's 110 millimetres, is what I would say it is, it's only a little lathe. What is it, a Boxford? Yeah, look, Halifax, England. Bought it from a school. I did. It's really good. It, it needs a clean. It's even got under seal on. Look, when I've been spraying, honestly, I'm terrible. But I was using this last night. It does the job. Very, very useful piece of kit. Very happy with it. But yeah, it does. Yeah, and it, look, there's some more of those little spaces that I made. That's the last time I made them. 
when I started from scratch. Useless, honestly. Whole saw, that's what you need, Andy. Right, okay, back to the bench. Oh, what have I got? I've got one cigarette left, so let's have that and we'll do a, we'll do a few more minutes because you guys are great for me. And I think, even though my coffee, this is my first coffee of the day that I did at about quarter to eight, it would have been, and it's now, nearly, well, it's about 10 o'clock. Is it still warm? Is it warmer than this one? Mmm, that's stone cold. It is. I'll stick with this one. Mmm, good old thermo mugs. So like I say, if you'd like a sticker, uh, one of the toolbox stickers, then um, if you do, if, when you get them, so first of all, send me an email through today, last chance, I'm extending it, so last chance, gotta be in the next 24 hours. In fact, no, it's gotta be in the next 18 hours, because um, I'll be doing the spreadsheet first thing tomorrow morning for Mrs. Mechanic. Uh, once you get your sticker, um, again, send me through a picture of your toolbox with a sticker on, that'd be really cool. Or even maybe a short video if you like, I don't mind. So, there you go Graham, it was 110 millimeters. I'll know that for now, I've never, I don't think I've ever measured it. I did actually, <laughs> I remember um, Team Henry, which is a little Suzuki Alto, Charlotte was complaining of brake pedal pulsations. Um, oh, this would be about 18 months ago, before I even got my workshop properly set up. So I took the discs off, and they're so small, the discs on the little Suzuki Alto. It's only a 660cc engine, by the way. Super light little car. I managed to fit the discs in the lathe and face them off. Fixed the problem. Bloody good. Took a while to set them up with the DTI to get them absolutely bang on in the chuck, but, um, it, you know, refacing them, and off she went. She was very happy. And zero cost, as Ivan would say, no parts required. Didn't make a video though, I should have made a video, but I thought I was going to get some serious ridicule for doing it in the lathe. But I don't know, it seemed to work. Uh, Jim K, how much under seal are you going to go through? Well, Jim, there's 15 units to do, and each unit will take about 10 cans of under seal. That's 150 litres of under seal. It's, and the retail price is $30 New Zealand per can, so it's a significant cost. But definitely worth doing you know cost per unit is not that high it's a lot of work but um man the, we've, we've had them i've been doing them now from brand new for the last couple of years and when i'm servicing the, the even the ones that are two years old um the difference is unbelievable there's really hardly any rust at all on the machines uh and and zero uh coil spring breakages which is one of the big problems that we, which we used to have Jim Haynes, have they started selling cheap Chinese cars and motorcycles, etc. in New Zealand? Yeah, there's plenty of them around. Um, there's lots of great wall utes uh, here in New Zealand. Um, they are cheap, they're nasty, I don't like them, and uh, they don't last very long. And yeah, just poor quality components. Brakes and stuff are forever wearing out on them. Um, yeah, not a fan, stay well away. Motorcycles, um, there's lots of, yeah, I think there's, is it Lifen? Are they, are they Chinese? Um, there's also lots and lots of um, Chinese scooters to the point where it's really destroyed the market for the, for the, um, the top end brands. There's just no point in, in, in them selling them here in New Zealand anymore because they can't compete. Um, there's just not enough margin. So a lot of main manufacturers have pulled out of New Zealand and you can't buy a 50cc uh, scooter anymore from them. Jim, spring's number one uh, enemy is rust. That's right, as soon as a coil spring gets a, a, a pock mark of rust in it, it becomes a weak point and it will break. It's as simple as that, and I've replaced so many over the years. Uh, Simon, you're going to have shares in the underseal factory soon. 
I don't know about that. Um, I'm just a big supporter of 3M. I think it's I think it's the it's the best under seal that I've come across here in New Zealand. Uh, it's not a water based under seal. I've tried that. That just seems to crack in the sunlight over here. Uh, it doesn't seem to work very well. Um, obviously, most under seal is used underneath the car, so there is no sunlight. Um, but when you're using it on a chassis application, sunlight does get on it, and uh, the water based stuff seems to crack. Um, Graham McGlucky, do you have the machinery uh, house catalogue? Yes, I do. Page 47 is the vertical. What a bloke. Right, I will look that up. Uh, it's probably a little bit late in the day to get one for this round of fabrication. I need to just get on with it. Um, and I've already spent some, some of my hard-earned cash with the tool that I've chosen to do the job. Um, but I think that will be a really useful tool, actually, to complement the lathe. So... I will definitely put that on my wish list uh, and we'll get one in for the next round. I was even considering buying a milling machine, to be honest. I mean, you can buy, uh, they've got them for sale for about two and a half grand. Uh, don't need a big one. I haven't got a lot of space in here, but uh, even a little milling machine, not, not a hobby size one, but a smaller commercial one, uh, has to be single phase. Um, yeah, they had them on sale at the moment, about two and a half K, so I am tempted. I am, you know. Jim, uh, have I used fluid film yet? No, I haven't. The The problem with, and there are similar products around. Hang on, I'll show you. Uh, now, one of the surf clubs, um, a guy called Laurie, jeez, a guy called Laurie used to work for this company. Prolan. Uh, it's similar to kind of fluid film stuff. It's it's a fish-based product. It's environmentally friendly, it says on here. It's a uh, protective lanolin. And he swears by this stuff. He really does. He says, oh, you should be using this. You should be using this. Don't use your underseal. Use this. And he used this on his on, on the vehicles before I used to underseal them. And uh, they did still rust. And the, the problem with it is it needs to be regularly applied. Because the vehicles are on on the beach they're going over sand and it gets rubbed off and then of course the rust starts again plus they wash the vehicles or they're supposed to wash the vehicles every day after use to get the salt water off and uh, again that the, just the washing itself washes off that lanolin so it relies on regular application which pr which they proved wasn't happening i mean poor, poor old lorry he's retired he doesn't have time to go down every week and or every couple of weeks and reapply it um, with the 3M product, I put it on, it takes me, I can do two units in a day if I work my ass off, and that, that's just the application, it takes longer to take a lot of parts off and put all the parts back on again, but the actual application I can do two in, two in a day, uh, it's not a very nice job at all, I hate doing it, but it needs to be done, and um, once it's on, that's it, apart from the odd little touch up during a service, if I spot any areas that have got rubbed off, um, it's done. It doesn't need any additional maintenance or management on a regular basis. So for that very reason, and the fact it's very durable, um, that's what I've chosen as uh, what we're going to be using. And it works well, and I'm not going to change it. Um, Jim K, got to love Minnesota mining and manufacturing. Three. <laughs> Machine NZ. Morning, Andy. Already just started watching the stream. Oh, stickers are on the way to you. Good man. Welcome aboard. You only just made it. And you can thank the cigarette for that because I decided I had one last cigarette and I'll stay online just for a little bit longer for you. Um, but no, as you can see, I've not even used this stuff yet. It gave me it a couple of years ago and um, maybe a job will come in that uh, I can use it upon. But other than that, it'll just sit on the shelf for however long. Simon. Fluid film. We didn't get it in the UK. I used chain wax. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, Simon Roll, on the back of hub faces, etc. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I mean, obviously on motorcycles and stuff, you can't be using underseal. That just wouldn't work. And, and in actual fact, um, some of the surf clubs used to use ATVs years ago when I was working at Henderson uh, for a, a manufacturer that I can't name. They we service quite a few other ATVs and 
again, the salt water just destroyed the frames on them. It, they didn't last that long. Um, by the time by the time they came off the three year service, if they'd lasted three years, um, they they really were. They some of them weren't even fit for use after that. The, the frames were cracked. They were very badly corroded, uh, and they really were only any good for parts. Um, applying under seal to an ATV would be a it'd be a mammoth task because the, the the frame is so much closer to the engine and everything. It'd be quite difficult, I think, to get to get a good coverage without pretty much taking the whole ATV apart. The RRVs, they just seem easier to work on. There's more gaps, basically, so you can get you can get in there and spray around. Um, I have to I have to mask off the engine, for example, the top end of the engine, and other bits and pieces, the brake discs, for example. But Mrs. Mechanic's well trained on that kind of stuff, so she tends to do most of the masking for me. Uh, Jim Haynes, the hub to wheel faces on your trailer would be great for stuff he gave you. It, they would. You're right. There you go. You see, we've found a use for it already. Uh, and I do need, to, I've got my old trailer, my old Eiffel Williams, a small one, does need some love. Ben's got it at the moment up in Auckland. And it's supposed to be coming down in the next few weeks once he finishes his, his uni exams. Um, and I need, I need to service the brakes on it. Uh, I've got some wider wheels, some heavy duty wheels for it. I need to get some new tyres, get it all sorted out. Probably probably there'll be some wiring issues to deal with on it because it's getting pretty old and it'll be getting close to a warrant of fitness. So we need to get it all tidied up and get it fit for use again. Um, but it's been a fantastic trailer. And on the new one, obviously, I mean, it's done about probably about 22,000 kilometres now since I got it, which would be about, about a year, be a year ago. I've had that big trailer for a year now. Time flies, doesn't it? Um, that's going to need a service as well. It's going to need the brakes pulling off and just checking. Um, but the brakes are working really well. There's no problem with that. I, I don't have any issues with it at all at the moment. The only thing I had to do was uh, rewire or tidy up the wiring on one of the front marker lights. Uh, they hadn't quite put the wire in properly and it had dropped out. It, it, the, the little screw clamps inside. And um, yeah, the light just went out. It just started to flicker one day and I thought, well, I better take a quick look. And that's all it was. Uh, Jim, have you found any tyres for the trailers that are not China-made junk? Yes, 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 yes. The tyres that, um, I think it was King's tyres that we had all the problems with on the little trailer. Um, they finally decided to give me uh, replacements of not King's. They gave me, they, they upgraded the tyres to another brand. I can't tell you what it is because the trailer's not here. Uh, it is on a video somewhere. Uh, on the channel and um, we've had absolutely no problems whatsoever since that point. Um, the problem was just very poor quality tyres that even though they were rated for the loading of the trailer, um, they just weren't up to the job. They just were not. Uh, I tend to be, with that little trailer, it tends to get thrown around quite a bit. Um, you know, especially behind the utes, tend to push it pretty hard and, um, you know, they just disintegrated basically. Um, but now I've got the big trailer. Whenever I need to carry any real heavy loads, they just go in there. Easy. I tend to use that a lot more now. And Ben's got the little one for a while. He might even take it back up to Auckland at some point because he, he finds it quite useful. Uh, and I don't really have the need to have both trailers down here, to be honest. Um, Machine NZ, does the trailer have the electric brakes? No, it doesn't. Our trailer at work has had nothing but problems. I am not a fan of electric brakes in any way whatsoever. We have a, a trailer at work with electric brakes, a big box trailer, and I was towing it and I had I was coming back from Wellington with it and it was shocking. Um, I was coming down Desert Road, it was wet, it was raining hard, and could, there's some pretty tight corners on Desert Road if you've ever driven it. And sometimes coming down to a corner, either you had no brakes on the trailer they just didn't come on or they just went on full bore and the wheels just locked up it was dangerous it was dangerous to the point that when I finally got home um, here uh, and that trailer still needed to go back to Auckland I put the tra their box trailer on my big trailer and took it back to Auckland on that because I was not happy towing it, um, it it's it's a I mean some people swear by them um, I prefer you know for commercial use, for long distance driving, like I do, uh, I much prefer the traditional drum brakes. Uh, New Zealand seems to be very keen, if it's not electric brakes, trailers tend to have hydraulic disc brakes. 
um, or hydraulic drum brakes, usually disc brakes now. Uh, but the problem is the master cylinder only has one chamber. They're not they're not a split brake system. So if you rupture a brake line or you run out of fluid because nobody's bothered to top it up, um, then again you've got no brakes. Um, with the Eiffel Williams trailers, uh, each brake is individually applied um, by a cable. There's a steel bar that goes from the hitch at the front onto like a, a linking uh, piece, which then activates all four cable brakes. If a cable snaps, you've still got three brakes out of four, or in this case, five brakes out of six. Um, I think a much, much safer way, a far more durable, a lot less things to go wrong. You're not relying on wires that can corrode and fail and crack and snap and all that kind of stuff. It's not reliant on electrics. It's a mechanical system and it seems to be very, very, very reliable. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just just don't like electric brakes and it and on some electrical electric brake trailers you have to have something uh you've got to modify the towing vehicle and fit equipment into that like the 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 adjuster and stuff you know um and it also depends on how your trailer sockets wired up sometimes there's incompatibility there as well so it becomes a problem and you know to someone that doesn't know they go and borrow a mate's trailer that's got electric brakes and they don't work then it's just a recipe for disaster, isn't it? Anyway, we're done. One hour and 45 minutes. We've had we've got 33 viewers still at the end of the live stream, which is pretty impressive. And 40 likes. Look at that. It's fantastic. Um, so don't forget, last chance, if you want one of these uh, toolbox, tool girl holly, tool, toolbox sticker things, uh, then send me an email through today. Don't leave it because you won't get on the list and uh, I'll stick you in there and we'll get them out next week for you. Uh, now, obviously due to COVID and postage and everything, it might take a few weeks to get to you, but rest assured they'll be on the way and I'll confirm that they've all gone out on the next live stream next Sunday. And I'll be underseeing the next Sunday. So it might be a short live stream. We'll see how things go. Um, okay, last one. Uh, Machine NZ, totally agree. Jim Haynes, most trucks here in the US are pre-wired for, tra for, for trailer brake controllers and sockets. Ah, well, they're not here in New Zealand. Absolutely not. Um, yeah, I just don't like them at all, Jim. Sorry, just don't like them. Much prefer the mechanical system and uh, and the drum brake, mechanical actuated brakes. Uh, I'm not really a fan of hydraulic brakes for the reasons that I've already pointed out. Not on trailers. Okay, crew. Well, I've run out of cigarettes. That's the end of the live stream. Thank you very much for joining. It's been great fun talking to you. We've covered lots of stuff today. Uh, looking forward to getting into that, uh, that buggy for Jared. And um, thank you again, Jared, for your time on the phone. You've cleared up a few, you know, an issue over that date stamp on the, on the grinding disc and stuff. Uh, we've covered paddle switches on grinders, which I don't like. Uh, just my preference. Some people do, some people don't. I don't think it'll work for me. Uh, Sergeant Joe Smith, hi, Andy. Just got a computer. Joe, we're just about to sign. I'm signing off right now. You've missed it, mate. I'm sorry. I can't keep going. I've got. I've got. To, I've, I've been working my ass off all week to keep today free to do some work, some more work on the carport. It's a lovely day outside, and we need to get some more timber put up. Um, so that's it. Until next time, crew. I may hopefully have time this next coming week to make another video on the CB750, uh, and we'll be looking at that front brake problem. Okay, crew, thanks again for watching. <laughs> See you around. Cheers. Over and out.